Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Thomas. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Provable. Um, Provable is a blockchain oracle service that has been operating in the Ethereum space since 2015. So during, during this presentation, I will show you what is the trust model that we are using with our Oracle service. And um, we try to understand what are the trust implications and what's the challenge behind the you know, designing of such Oracle services. And uh, in the last part, I will like introduce a new project based on the same trust model, which is called the P tokens. And this is basically a two-way peg for uh, tokens which are native to one blockchain so that we can use them like on Ethereum or on other blockchains. So let's start with uh, like a brief introduction to understand the um, like some terms that we will be using a lot during the presentation. So the three entities we are interested in are basically um, the uh, data source, which is like a web API or a source for external data that doesn't live on the blockchain. Uh, then we have the application, which typically will be a smart contract. And we have the Oracle, which is this like new intermediary in a world that is trying to get rid of intermediaries, right? Um, so why do we need like an Oracle to reach out to external data? Well, this is because of the way the blockchain works. So it's not possible to reach out to like the internet from within the blockchain. So the Oracle somehow enables that. We see later how this is possible, but the Oracle is basically an actor that operates on the blockchain, but is also capable somehow to reach out outside to the data source. So as you see already here, um, the data source is always to be trusted because the data um, in general is, is something inherently trusted. Like uh, if we have a smart contract that needs to release a payment when uh, you know, a given flight is late or if the temperature uh, is reaching uh, some degrees or um, like uh, if the number of views of a YouTube video go above a certain limit, uh, then we always have like a third party that is like claiming what the correct answer to those questions is. So one example for the number of like views for a YouTube video is that YouTube is the one telling us how many views the video has, and we have no way to independently verify that. So we always need to trust uh, YouTube. In the same way, if we, if I was to asking you, like, what's the temperature here today? I'm sure I would get different answers, but most of you will probably look for the first results on Google. And the reality is that we don't know, like, uh, the precision that we are looking for. As for the this data, we don't know the exact location. Um, so you know, the data source is always making some assumptions. So we need to trust the. Um, the data source for the data is providing. It's like the data we are pushing to the blockchain is always uh, um, like a, a claim coming from the data source. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> so, um, as I said, we have been around for a while, so this enabled us to collect some interesting data. Uh, the data you can see here is quite small, but it will help you to um, to understand it. So over the last uh, like four years, we have processed over one million transactions on the Ethereum mainnet asking for external data. And if you look on GitHub, there are approximately 1,000 uh, GitHub open source uh, smart contracts that are basically using the Oracle service. So we have like processed this data to understand what those contracts do, what's their like uh, field. Um, and basically what we found out is that, th of course, there is a lot around, uh, you know, DeFi, so um, asset and tokens or, you know, ICOs that need to check a price feed because maybe they want to fix, like, uh, uh, the contribution uh, in uh, USD instead, but they receive ethers or things like that. But there is also a lot around uh, gambling, as you can see here, because the randomness is yet another, like, piece of data which is not easy to compute straight on the blockchain without having um, like the miners to possibly collude. So uh, the, the role of the Oracle goes way beyond the fetching of the data from a web API. It could be really the offloading to, of a computation to an off-chain context, but it could be much more as we see later. So the model that um, provable uh, as adopted is the one of using uh, the basically trusted computing techniques 
to prove that the data we are fetching from a web API is indeed authentic and it has not been tampered with during the delivery process. So you don't want the Oracle to potentially uh, like compromise the data. So you're, you're already trusting the data source. You shouldn't trust uh, the Oracle as the Oracle could potentially you know, change the data it has received from the data source and just push something different to the blockchain. So it may trigger like a wrong payment on the blockchain or it may lead to wrong results. So what you want is the Oracle not to be trusted and that's why you need the, um, like some kind of proofs that the data delivered is correct, is, uh, is authentic. So Provable has been doing that with um, um, trusted computing techniques. For those of you who are not familiar around trusted computing, the idea is to basically use some uh, like uh, dedicated uh, chips that provide uh, sandboxing in uh, hardware for the execution of a given piece of code. So basically we publish the code that gets executed on those special machines and we, those machines help to, pro to generate an authenticity proof. So it's basically something that along with the result helps to understand that the computation has happened within those safe boundaries. We send them to the blockchain and then basically this provides like a shield against uh, uh, manipulations during the data delivery. So this enables you to verify that the Oracle has sent the answer but is not the like owner of the data and the owner of the data is really the website. So there has been no alteration during the process. This is why they are called like authenticity pros. Um, there are many like uh, challenges around oracles. It's not just around you know proving the authenticity of data, which has been uh, our main uh, uh, like focus for the last years. There are many more challenges. So uh, as you can see here, one is around uh, you know relying on reliable data sources. We don't want to you know push data to the blockchain in a way which is secure and then have low quality data sources that cannot really be trusted. So this is something where, um, well, players like uh, Thomson Reuters, but also Streamer and few others are working a lot so that they can basically um, provide some guarantees on the uh, selected data sources and they can provide quality data uh, to, to the blockchain. Um, and the way to basically not rely on a single trust line uh, on the data source front is to basically use more than one data source. So in the case of the price of Ether, for instance, is quite simple because you can just you know, do an average on uh, all the exchanges that have the majority of the trading volumes. So you have something accurate which doesn't have like points of failure theory. Um, but it depends, it can get much harder depending on the data you want. As I said, for the, with the example of the number of views for a YouTube video, you have no possibility to go, you know, to, to avoid the trust line with Google because it's just something which inherently belongs um, to, to YouTube, right? So YouTube is somehow the only data source you, you, you will need to, to reach out to. Um, then as for the like authenticity of the data, um, we have been using few technologies such as uh, like the trusted execution environment of uh, Qualcomm, the Ledger Nano S, the some, of you, some of you may be familiar with, uh, and Intel SGX. So this is something uh, that also um, Chainlink with uh, the Town Crier project has been working on. Um, there are a few options on that front, but using trusted computing is quite general purpose, so it can help to basically provide those guarantees for the execution of something on the off-chain context while uh, interacting with the on-chain context. Um, also, there is a lot of work going on on the protocol that those oracles should use while uh, speaking with the blockchain. Uh, so Chainlink, but also MakerDAO, Compound, uh, Rhombus, and others, also Witnet, uh, they, they are working on, on that front. Um, we have been doing so for a few years as well, and I think those systems will end up to interoperate one with the other, and depending on like the needs of the smart contract, there will be the adoption of one system over the other. So for example, as you will see in a second, uh, the provable one is optimized for being cost effective on chain, so the gas cost is very low, and it doesn't give strong guarantees on the fact that the, an answer will be provided, but it provides guarantees on the fact that when an answer is sent to the blockchain, it's really authentic. So you know that basically if you get an answer, the answer is secure. Uh, while other systems focus also on like uh, giving some more guarantees around the redundancy, 
so that basically you can potentially have um, also a guarantee that the, re the result will be uh, sent. So that's why, for instance, we are looking to integrate with other systems here. So if someone is interested to pay a premium because maybe they want more redundancy, then they can go via other Oracle systems and still benefit from our authenticity pros. So over the years, what we have um, like heard from the community, as for the community feedback, is basically that this is what they were looking for, like uh, re reduced cost because many times you have like um, a transaction on Ethereum that needs to reach out to external data and you don't really want this external data fetching to like uh, increase significantly the cost of your transaction. You're already paying uh, like uh, the gas price for confirming the transaction. You don't want the Oracle to impact significantly on that cost. So this is why having a fully decentralized approach is typically more expensive, and for some applications, it may be um, like uh, it may not be a good fit. So it depends on the application. If you have an application where, for instance, you want to like get external data for every transaction, doing it in a fully decentralized way may be way, way more expensive. So it depends. Like for gambling, for instance. I don't think that uh, decentralization provides really a strong benefit on the random number generation part. While for other things like price fits, you may want like to get data every few minutes instead of that than every transaction. So you may want to opt in in a more like uh, decentralized uh, uh, approach and pay a premium for that. Um, also, the other things you see here like uh, data security, so the authenticity proofs approach and more, they are all like uh, critical components that are needed because you don't want to compromise the security of your smart contract again. Um, and um, also reputation systems, of course, are something that is often uh, mentioned and that somehow um, is uh, part of those uh, Oracle systems that are being implemented. And well, the ease of use as well, because you really want to you know, um, you, you don't want the Oracle components to complicate too much the way your application uh, is uh, structured. So, um, so basically the technologies, uh, as I said, that we work with are basically, uh, well, blockchain in general, because we don't integrate just with Ethereum. We have integrations with a few blockchains, but Ethereum is the one with most of the traction. And uh, trusted execution environments, so trusted computing techniques of uh, different uh, kinds. Um, so, um, at the moment, we have approximately 200 uh, projects that are reaching out to Provable every month from their smart contracts to, to get real-world data. And as I said, most of them are around uh, like the generation of random numbers, uh, price feeds, or like a variety of web API calls that connect uh, some advanced uh, like off-chain uh, computations typically with the uh, on-chain smart contracts that may just, you know, release a payment. So um, Oracleize is currently integrated with Ethereum mainnet, but also with many testnets, uh, basically all the main Ethereum uh, uh, testnets, and also with um, like uh, other Oracle's network uh, and with uh, some side chains. So we have focused a lot in the last few years on the random number generation use case because it's actually um, a strong need and it has been one of the first applications getting some traction in the Ethereum space and before also in the Bitcoin space. Uh, if you think of Satoshi Dice, which was like the first application on Bitcoin that caused uh, like a spike in the transaction volumes in 2012. Um, so the technology we have used to like provide the provable random number generator, which is a part of the Oracle, are the ones you see mentioned here. So it's quite interesting, uh, the use of the uh, Ledger TE, because most of us know the Ledger Nano S as the you know, hardware wallet to secure you know, ETH or other tokens. Uh, but the reality is that the security guarantees provided by the Ledger Nano S could be used for custom applications, and you can really implement anything within the safe boundaries of the Ledger Nano S while proving to third parties that you know, the application was really running on a Ledger Nano S with no alterations. So this is what we are using for the random number generator, for instance. Um, these are the networks I was mentioning where we are uh, integrated. As you see, we also have like other Ethereum-based uh, networks such as RSK, uh, but also other networks which are not Ethereum-based. 
uh, EVM based, such as uh, EOS, uh, Art Recorder, Fabric, and others. So um, everyone is discussing this year about DeFi, which is really a new term for something that you know we have always discussed, which is the potential of decentralized financial applications in this space. Um, so I found that tweet uh, a few months ago quite interesting, um, as it's basically showing, as we have seen in other presentations as well, that um, like the composability of those DeFi tools is somehow leading to many interesting use cases, and everyone is building on top of other components that are built by other teams. So uh, thinking about that, um, I, I think we could really split the needs of DeFi in two categories. So the first one is the engine, which is like the platform where you want to run the DeFi uh, tool. And at the moment, it's mostly Ethereum, right? So we have something that are like on, on EOS, but it's still quite limited. Why? Because on, on EOS, you don't really have other, you know, the rest of the ecosystem is sort of missing. So Ethereum uh, got a lot of traction for different reasons, for the technology, but I would say that one of the main points in favor of Ethereum today is the huge like developers base and the user base and the fact that we already have some initial traction differently than other blockchains. So this is probably one of the main reasons why DeFi is being built there and why there are so many new tools that are being built there. Um, so interoperability of blockchain and composability of the, those DeFi tools are helping to like grow significantly um, the, the relevance of DeFi in general. So the first thing you need is like the engine, as I said, which today is Ethereum and that, that's fine as there doesn't seem to be like requests from the users to, to move it elsewhere. So that's, that, that's where we are building. Um, and then you need assets, right? Uh, this is what's also listed in the tweet, but we, we have been seeing like uh, tokens of all kinds that you know are interest uh, bearing or that have other properties. Um, think of uh, like uh, wrapped uh, Bitcoin is one example of that, where you have a federation securing uh, basically an ERC20 token on Ethereum, um, which is collateralized by Bitcoin. Um, and yeah, um, the point is, do we really believe that like all those DeFi tools will never have any need outside of Ethereum? Well, I, I guess the answer is already there with WBTC, right? We see there is a first need for uh, like uh, um, going beyond the limits of the platform where the DeFi tools are operating, which is Ethereum. Um, so we have, if you look on coin market cap, the like tools being uh, the the assets being traded that have most of the uh, volumes and also the liquidity are not just ethereum based so some of them are ethereum based but you have many others that are not ethereum based not to talk about the you know non blockchain assets so there is a strong need to go beyond that so that's why we started to work on this new project called uh, the p tokens this is based on uh, the provable infrastructure and provable technology P stands for a few things. It stands for provable, but it also stands for uh, portable tokens and also for pegged tokens. Because what they are is really just a two-way pack with uh, tokens from that live natively on a different uh, blockchain than Ethereum, but the P tokens are their representation on, it, on Ethereum. So it's basically the, the same thing uh, you may have already tested out with WBTC, uh, but it goes beyond that because it could either be like in support of a federation, so it could be something you use on top of WBTC, or it's something you can use to potentially uh, like uh, replicate WBTC without the federation, or start other tokens uh, without bootstrapping a new federation uh, again and again. So I believe this is like quite significant for the impact it could have on uh, DeFi. So I want to explain to you how it works. Uh, the, the trust assumption is the same one we had built the uh, provable Oracle service on. So it uses trusted computing to secure the pegging. And it can be integrated with like any blockchain really for the way it works. So it's very general purpose. Um, so let me show you what's the, uh, what's the flow. So this is um, like a general representation of the Ethereum blockchain on the right. And on the left, you have a blockchain which is non-Ethereum based. So it's like, uh, um, the, the first one we, we, we release is uh, EOS, as it didn't exist on Ethereum, so it will be like a P-EOS token on Ethereum. Um, 
but it, this, this applies really to any blockchain. So it could be Bitcoin, it could be, you know, Ripple or whatever, where, whatever there is a, a need for uh, in the DeFi ecosystem uh, on, uh, on Ethereum. So you have the trusted execution environment in the middle, which is this secure sandbox executed on IntelliJ checks in this case. Um, and basically what the, um, what the, what happens is that the, the secure enclave at the moment is running within uh, like those boxes that we had as part of our infrastructure, but it could be run anywhere. So you can run it on your own like Intel SGX machine. It could be run in the cloud with some Intel SGX uh, um, enabled uh, machines, or you can just use one of those machines as well. If um, like um, you want to potentially secure this two way pack and contribute to the redundancy of it. So, it doesn't, it needs to be limited to Intel SGX. The concept uh, goes beyond SGX itself, but the first implementation will be on SGX as it's the like easier, um, the easiest to get started with and the code is quite complex at the moment. Uh, the code is open source, so basically anyone will be able to, uh, to verify the code and know that the two-way peg is actually secure and it's running as intended. So it gives full transparency which is not reputation based. So that's why you don't, you don't necessarily need a federation. You can potentially use it without a federation or in support of a federation to minimize the trust in the players uh, involved. So we, in the PEOS uh, um, use case, uh, that's what happens uh, with the issuance of new PEOS tokens. So you basically send um, like uh, an EOS transaction to a specific address, which is probably under the control of the enclave of the trusted execution environment. And then you send to the trusted execution environment a proof of that, like a proof of the deposit. So the enclave will be able to verify that this deposit happened correctly and will authorize on Ethereum a transaction where that basically issues the new PEOS tokens. So the opposite happens when you want to like uh, burn the token and redeem the PEOS token. So the PEOS token can f like freely um, be exchanged on Ethereum as any ERC20 token. And at any time, in an automated way, with no manual intervention, it can just be redeemed for the underlying asset, which in this case is EOS. So what you will do is basically burning the EOS, uh, the PEOS token. And when you burn it, you specify the EOS address that where you want to redeem the, the EOS tokens on. And what happens is that basically after the trusted execution environment has verified that everything uh, is uh, correct, it will release the EOS uh, tokens accordingly. So there is no possibility to steal funds. It's uh, fully transparent and secure thanks to the trusted computing component. And yeah, so um, we have a, a demo working. Uh, we plan to release the production version of the PEOS uh, token by end of month. But now we are looking for community feedback and we are discussing with DeFi tools to see if they are interested and what tokens they would like to, to, to have uh, on Ethereum. So if you are interested to potentially have like on Ethereum uh, uh, a token which is not there at the moment, uh, please reach out and we will be happy to, to support you. So this is the DAP that you will be uh, connecting to. This is already actually, uh, everything is already working. We are finalizing the enclave component at the moment, but the blockchain component is already finalized. So what you have in the DAP is, um, well, just a transparent uh, um, lookout to like the minting events and burning events. So you can check that, you know, the PEOS tokens and the underlying EOS tokens um, do match. Um, and then you will see the state of the enclave. So this is the trusted computing. You will see the last EOS and the last Ethereum block that, is, that are known to the enclave. Um, and there are some statistics here on like the operations that has been done by the enclave and that, and that are reported by it. You can also like issue and redeem via the DAP uh, the tokens independently at any time with no intervention. So that's much faster than any alternative solution like uh, WBTC or in general, uh, since there is no human intervention for the main thing or anything like that, it can be really done very quickly. So in the case of like uh, Bitcoin, for example, you would just need to wait for the confirmation time. So this is uh, a recap. So basically, um, we have worked a lot recently on securing uh, like the, the Oracle service. Uh, which is already like uh, stable and used uh, a lot on the Ethereum mainnet. Uh, we have also released like new certifications for regulated casinos around the provable RNG. 
But our recent area of focus has become the P tokens, which we believe will use the same technology while providing like a service which is strongly needed today in the DeFi ecosystem. So if you are interested, um, well, sorry, this was like ptokens.io is a website where you can go and there is like a white paper. There is the, the draft of a white paper that we have released uh, today. And there is a Telegram channel where you can join the discussion if you are interested uh, on the topic. So it's ptokens.io. Um, thank you for your, for your attention. Thanks.